Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So today, Catholicos, Catholics, we're going to be talking about communion in the hand and whether the current practice, as you've seen it in most uh, Roman Catholic churches, is actually um, uh, not a fraud, to put it simply. Not a fraud. Thing is, the story is, oh, in the early church, people received communion in the hand. You know, Jesus said, take and eat, take and eat, you know. Go to the buffet and take and eat all you want. Um, but of course, it is a fraud. Because the current practice, you can see on the screen here, it's based on pretty much one quotation from Cyril, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Now, from a lecture, from a um, catechesis uh, he did for Easter Holy Week. Now, there are people who say, current uh, uh, scholars, who dispute the authenticity of that quotation because uh, some of this catechesis are authentic. Some have been a bit later. So some people suspect it could have been his successor, but he kept his name under Cyril. But in any case, even if you take it as is, there's nothing absolutely wrong with it. It is... I'm going to go through it. Thing is, um, the thing is, even if for argument's sake, we assume that for the first 500 years, every Christian in every part of the world, from Asia and India all the way to Britain, was receiving Holy Communion in the hand and grabbing it and giving it to themselves. And you will see that ne that never happened. But assuming if it, if it was so, with the gradual, with the passing of time, with the deeper faith of the real presence of Christ, that this is God, this is Christ, this is his very flesh, we dare not touch God. Do you believe this is God? Is it God or is it not God? If it is just a man, as a piece of meat, as a piece of bread, yeah, who cares? But if it is God... Would you dare to grab God and give him to yourself? Now, uh, as I'm going as, as an argument. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. If it happened for the first 500 years. But it didn't. Uh, but even if it did, that does not void the growing reverence and the growing respect to the Holy Eucharist, to the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. Because it is God incarnate upon our altars. And we dare not touch the most holy of holies. Because we are defiled no matter how holy we think we are. So, but let's get, we got that point out of the way. Now let's go to the, the, the quotation which is always um, referred to from Cyril of Jerusalem. And I have it here as well, the history of the Roman Rite. It's two volumes by Joseph Jungman. Youngman. SJ. So he tries to talk about the development and origin of the Roman Rite. Um, a lot of people as well dispute his scholarship. So, And even him, he talks about this handling of the... He gives that quote. And then he says, well, others uh, gave proof of other fathers mentioning it. But he doesn't give quotations. It's like in a, in a footnote and uh, in Latin or Greek. Who's going to go search for it? Give me the full quotation and let me know. Anyway, so this is the lecture from St. Cyril of, uh, from, of Jerusalem. Um, and it's a big long one, actually, but um, we will go down to the uh, quotation, which is always, always cited as, look, in the early church, they all received communion in the hand. Again, one more point, even up to the, 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 to the, up to the Council of Trent, up to the 16th, 17th centuries, even in Europe, just Europe, different cathedrals had their own unique way of doing certain things. So just because one bishop in one city allowed or told his parishioners to receive communion in that manner does not mean that every church in every place on the planet did the same thing. It doesn't. Because even up to the Council of Trent, and after that, in the West, we had the rites of Milan and Paris, and different cathedrals had their own way of doing, doing certain things. So anyways, so this is the, the catechesis. But this, I'm not going to go through. 
So it's in uh, chapter 20, uh, section 21, but section 19, let's read it. It says here, after the priest says, holy things are for holy men. And actually in the Byzantine liturgy, it says, the holy is for the holy. It's still repeated, which means this stuff is holy and you have to be holy to receive it. Um, and then he says, then he say, uh, so the people would respond, one is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ. And then he explains, um, for one is truly holy by nature only. So God, Jesus Christ, is holy by nature, but we become holy, we become holy, not by nature, but by participation and discipline and prayer. Um, and then we can see here, uh, so after the chanter, so the singer, so even they had offices for singers and even in the church. Actually, I'm going to go, well, let's ignore that for a sec. But yeah, so the chanter, so the singer invites you with sacred melody. So that's the communion hymn. The, the communion chant as we would have it. The communion of the holy mysteries. They're holy mysteries. Even in the traditional Roman rite, a lot of times it is, instead of just saying the sacraments, they will say the mysteries. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to participate in the sacred mysteries, the holy mysteries. And saying, oh, and the saying, I guess the song would be, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So now here again, shows us the, this is truly God's body. This is truly divine. Trust not. Don't believe. Don't trust. The judgment of your bodily palate, your taste buds. Don't trust them. No, but to... F don't trust it. No, but to faith unfaltering. So with strong, unfaltering faith. For you have... For, for they who taste are bidden to taste not bread and wine... And as you've heard, probably, that 75% of Catholics don't believe that the body and blood of Christ is truly God himself. They believe it's just a symbol. No. You are not bread and wine, but the anti-type, anti-typical body and blood of Christ. And what does that mean? Uh, there is type and anti-type. So as explained here, type is a symbol of something which will be coming. The anti-type is the real thing. So Aaron would be the type. Jesus Christ would be the anti-type. So here, the bread and wine or are the symbol, or but like as an image. But th this is really the anti-type. It is the very body and blood of Christ. So don't trust your senses because this is the real thing. This is the body and blood of Christ. So here's the quotation which everybody kind of uses one quotation from one saint and makes it a rule for the universal church. Assumes a falsehood. So he says here, and we're going to see other fathers who dispute that. So he says, uh, approaching, don't come with your wrists extended or your fingers spread apart, but make your left hand a throne for your right. So this is my left hand, that's my right, so it's a throne for my right. Currently, the current practice is the exact opposite. They put the right below the left, and then they take the right and grab Holy Communion. What is written here, if you're trying to be, according to St. Cyril of Jerusalem, you want to imitate him, even though he's the only quotation I can find, he actually put the right on top of the left. Uh, as, for, as for that which is to receive a king, and having hollowed your palm, so you made it a bit, uh, you know, hollowed it, hollowed your palm, uh, receive the body of Christ, saying over it, Amen. Then, as, then, uh, So then, after having carefully hollowed your eyes and touched it, by touch of the holy body, partake of it. So I guess when they go like this, they come just kind of bring their, they say Amen, come their eyes close to it, or just hollow your eyes, just, just by seeing it, you have made your eyes um, holy. Then you receive it right off your hand, like this. You're not grabbing, you're not sticking in your mouth. You have received, you bow down, 
you receive it and you go. Now, if you watch uh, YouTube, watch uh, Coptic Orthodox liturgy. They still maintain this, but again, they have a cloth, which the person, the faithful, put a piece of cloth on their right hand. They go, they don't even put the, the host on it or the bread. They lift, they open up their mouth, they receive the body, and then they just cover their mouth with the cloth. So it is like a pattern or like the cloth spread below the mouth of people. So this is just as an additional thing. So, so this is the, the, the correct, according to this, to Jerusalem, uh, if it is authentic coat. Cyril of Jerusalem, you put the right on the left, you receive it, you say Amen, bow down, receive it, and continue. Now it says here, and having, oh, uh, so, amen. So after, after having carefully hollowed your eyes with the touch of the Holy Body, partake of it, giving heed. Now listen to this. And remember, this is leavened bread. So leavened bread does not leave residue as much as unleavened bread, which is the host we use. Hosts leave powdery residue. And if you believe the powdery residue is the body of blood of Christ, then it, the body of blood of Christ will be left on your hand. So anyways, he says here, uh, giving heed lest you lose any portion thereof, for whatever you lose is evidently a loss to you, as it were for, from one of your own members. So basically, kind of like you losing an eye, losing a hand, losing an ear. So if you lose even a particle, it's like you're losing part of your own very body. Um, for tell me, if anyone gave you grains of gold, would you not hold them with all carefulness, being on your guard against losing any of them and suffering loss? So, if somebody gives you gold, are you going to be pretty casual? Eh, eh, whatever. No, this is more precious than gold. So he says here, will you not then, will you not then much more carefully keep watch that not a crumb, not a crumb falls from you of what is more precious than gold and diamonds, precious stones. Then, after you have, so this, the Eucharist, the body, the bread, the holy God incarnate, is more precious than gold dust and diamonds. Don't let a crumb fall. But when you do this, you grab it, you stick them in your mouth, you have residue left on your hands. Crumbs fall on the ground, more precious than gold is being thrown and trampled on by Christ faithful. Faithful. Then after you have partaken of the body of Christ, draw near to the, also to the cup of his blood, not stretching out your hands, but bending and saying with an air of worship and reverence, Amen. Amen. So it's not, Amen, body of Christ, Amen, Amen. With reverence, bowing, reverence, Amen. Hollow you. Then you receive the blood of Christ. Again, there is no mention of them touching the chalice, because they wouldn't. The deacon, the function of the deacon, you will notice, it says always in the ancient literature, the deacon is the one holding the chalice, not the people. Uh, and then, of course, again, you have to be, you know, grateful for being counted worthy of so great mysteries. Hold fast to these traditions, undefiled, so don't be in sin, and keep yourselves free from offense. Sever not yourself from the communion. So don't separate, don't cut yourself, don't sever yourself from the communion. Deprive not yourself, so don't deprive yourself through the pollution of sins. So the pollution of sins, will de you deprive yourself from Holy Communion and cut yourself off from Holy Communion and the sacred mysteries through sin. So by sin, you cannot receive Holy Communion. How many times do... You have to read that in scripture, the fathers. So no, you can't be in an irregular situation committing sin and still receive Holy Communion and good conscience. Because St. Paul says you eat and drink judgment on yourself. So it says don't approach, don't cut yourself through sin of from these holy mysteries, holy and spiritual mysteries. So notice how even in that Mm, way of receiving it is full of emphasis on this 
bread is more precious than gold dust, more precious than diamonds. Don't let a particle fall, not a crumb, nothing. And again, the hand position is different. The, the way it's done now is the right is below the left. So you receive Christ on the left, and the left traditionally is considered the evil hand. Even the word sinister comes from left in Latin. And even the in witchcraft and magic is called the left-hand path, meaning the evil side, the left-hand path. Even in Arabic, they go, and it says, uh, 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 for example, this woman uh, is shemel, she's left, meaning... She's, she's an adulteress or something. The left. The left is consistently considered bad. So you're putting your hand, you're receiving God in the left. So this is almost diabolical. And then you take it and give yourself. You are com self-communicating. You're giving yourself God. You're not even bending down with the right and just receiving without touching yourself. You're not giving yourself. But now they give themselves. And notice there is no extraordinary ministers of Holy Eucharist. There is no lay person distributing. It is only the priest and the deacons. That's it. And actually the deacons never distributed the body. Only the cup, the chalice, only the blood. Only in extraordinary situations the deacon would give the body if he's visiting the sick or so forth. So this is the great... Uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, which they try to use for their own benefit for sacrilege against the body of Christ. So obviously it has nothing to do with what is going on in your local parish church. So now the other thing is people say, uh, should I do the fathers or do B uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider first? Uh, let's go with the... Uh, Let's go quickly with the fathers here. So let's see here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Why is it not opening? Oh, this is some. Uh, let's do the quick. Um, actually, let's do this one. This is, I think, is. Oh, this is uh, Saint John Chrysostom. So, St. Cyril of Alexandria, was uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, was almost the same contemporaneous with St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil the Great, both of whom emphasized the sacredness of the person touching the body, which is basically only the priest. So, in his book on the priesthood, so uh, here is what he says. So again, which shows you, okay, these are in Antioch, in, in Constantinople, and he's in Jerusalem, so they're like, you know, a few miles apart, not that far, which shows you, again, one practice might be in vogue in maybe Jerusalem, and maybe only Jerusalem, compared to another location. But again, you never know. So he says here, and whoever, whenever he invokes the Holy Spirit and offers the most dread sacrifice, again, the Eucharist is a sacrifice, not just some meal, and constantly handles, and he's talking about the priesthood and the priest here. So, and whenever he invokes the Holy Spirit, the priest, and offers the most dread sacrifice, the priest, and constant and constantly handles the common Lord of all. Tell me, what rank shall we give him? What great purity and what real piety must we demand of him? For consider what manner of hands they ought to be which minister in these things and what kind of tongue which utters such words and again so it shows you that the hands of the priest are different than the hands of the faithful and it actually says look the rites in themselves emphasize this celebration and he talks about a vision of seeing uh, angels surrounding the altar bowing down as as soldiers would bow in the presence of their king and you want to go up to the to the to the priest, take Christ in the left hand, and give him to yourself when the angels bow down before their king. That's John Chrysostom. Um, I, just, I want to do a quick uh, quotations of some of the fathers because Saint Basil the Great, was the same time as Saint John Chrysostom, again from Constantinople, allows communion in the hand only in case of persecutions. So. There's no priest. You have the body with you 
and here's a, you can self communicate. That's the only time you may touch the body of Christ. So let's uh, actually, I'll leave say, Bishop Ashtanazir Schneider because he has some really good points about. Uh, yeah, let's just do this and then we'll go back to Athanasius Schneider and uh, not, and then one of the most ancient documents, the Apostolic Tradition of Saint Hippolytus from 215 A.D which is actually the most, one of really, really important. Um, okay, so this one has a lot of actually uh, quotations, and maybe I should just do a link for this one so you can go over it yourself. So this was, uh, on the, and this was written by uh, Father McDonald, I think. Where is it here? Yeah, Father MacDonald. I think he's in Ontario, Canada. But anyways, he quotes a lot of things which are... So, statements from the popes and the church on councils. So, what uh, did uh, what did they say? St. Sixtus I, he's a pope from 115 AD. And that's usually written in the uh, uh, Roman... The history of the Roman popes, I think. The sacred vessels are not to be handled by others than those consecrated to the Lord. So, touching... The chalice or the pat and the sacred vessels are nobody's touching them except the priests, those consecrated with the consecrated hands. So imagine if only the priest can handle the vessel, do you think the faithful can handle the Lord of who is in the vessel? I don't think so. And then Pope uh, Eutychian forbade the faithful from taking the host in their hand. So I guess some people were, that's 275 to 283. So Pope forbade it. St. Basil the Great, which is a contemporary of St. Cyril of uh, Jerusalem, says the right to receive Holy Communion in the hand is permitted only in times of persecution. So he considers it something irregular. So it only can happen legitimately in time of persecution. Other than that, you're not allowed. Um, the Council of Saragossa in 380 excommunicated anyone who dares continue receiving Holy Communion by hand. So some people were still receiving it. They excommunicated in 380. So it's not in the Middle Ages on the 12th, 13th centuries, no. And actually, if you look at all the ancient churches, the Ethiopian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, the Coptic Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, the uh, the uh, Malabar Church in, Syria, in India, the they all, nobody touches the Eucharist. Uh, uh, let's see what else. I mean, Pope Leo the Great, again, talks about receiving it in the mouth. Council of Rouen, Rouen condemned, uh, condemned communion in the hand to halt that, to white, halt widespread sacrilege. And actually, I have the quote on another place. Do not put the Eucharist in the hands of any layman or laywoman, but only in their mouths. That's in 650. So, I don't think I need to go through a lot of other things here, but, uh, so this is the article actually by Father McDonald, which is really actually very, very useful. He talks about St. Cyril, which we went through already, and uh, talks about St. Leo the Great, Pope, again, talks about giving it in the mouth, and he has a quote of Pope St. Gregory the Great, which is in the 6th, 7th centuries. So, uh, Mm. St. Basil the Great, only at permitted in time of persecution. And it is necessary to show that it, it does not constitute a grave fault. A uh, person to communicate, oh, his letter. It is not necessary to show that it does not constitute a grave fault for a person to communicate with his own hand in a time of persecution. That's 330 to 379 when there is no priest or deacon, letter 93. So, don't tell me the one letter, one quotation from one saint is a universal custom. No, it's not. And these guys, he's in, in Constantinople and Bath, since Cyril is in Jerusalem. So after persecution, uh, okay, so, so after the persecution ended, there's no point in people giving the communion to themselves. Council of Rouen, we did that already, put only in their mouths, here it is. Uh, talks about St. Cyril, about some of the suspected ortho, of the, his successor maybe, but let's ignore that for now. 
It's neither here nor there. And the current communion in the hand is a Protestant 16th century innovation, specifically because I showed you the different hand positions and the way it's received. It was done specifically to deny the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that this is indeed God incarnate in, in the Eucharist. Um, and it talks about the fragments, of course. St. Cyril talks about the fragments. More precious than gold. Cannot be dropped or lost. Um, was it universal? Probably not. Um, the Last Supper. Okay, this is actually a good one here. Um, here's There's a quote. Here's the, Our Lord dipped a morsel of bread into some wine and gave it to Judas. Did he place this wet morsel into Judas's hand? Probably not. He probably gave it to his into his mouth. So, and furthermore, actually, the Bishop Schneider has a story of this uh, lady, and she tells the priest tells her, "Come on, the apostles, uh, everybody received it in their hands at the Last Supper," and she says. He, well, he gave the apostles in their hands and they took it and gave it to themselves. And she says, well, I'm not an apostle. We're not apostles. And even if that was true, but again, from the quote, maybe they didn't. Uh, that was true, then uh, they were apostles, they were priests. They could touch, not a layman. Um, this is a very good one. And it's a quotation from, uh, where is it here? From Ezekiel. And he talks, Son of man, eat what is offered to you. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the morsel to eat. And I opened it in the Vulgate, I opened my mouth and he, and he caused me to eat that book. And he said to me, Son of man, eat the scroll that I gave you and fill your stomach. So God is giving him the scroll, but he's not touching. He just opened up his mouth and he went into his mouth. I opened my, so I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. So that is that. And, um, and I want to go back to uh, really important uh, Hippolytus, but I want to just do finally Bishop Schneider and then go back to Hippolytus, the ap apostolic tradition from 215 AD. Which is very important. Um, so there's a lecture of Athanasius Schneider, and then there is the uh, what do you call it uh, interview. And actually, one one really important point is about the uh, um, the scriptures, because it says take and eat, and people say, didn't Jesus say take and eat? Didn't Jesus tell us to take and eat him? No, he didn't. So, um, so talking about the left hand, right hand thing. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, this is the important thing. Simply put, the English translation of the word, here, I'm bringing it up further up here. The English translation of the word take is wrong. The Greek verb uh, lambano uh, does not have the connotation of active taking as in English. The verb signifies a passive taking, or more accurately, to receive. So, Matthew 26, receive and eat. This is my body. And he actually says in the video lecture, he says, in Slavic countries in the East, the, they translated in, as to receive, not to take, but to receive. And uh, so it's a passive receiving. A passive taking it's not taking actively uh, and then because there is a by contrast the idea of actively taking as opposed to ta passive taking or receiving is denoted by the verb iro in John 1 29 we find behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world sin of the world um, and actually he does mention that this same word that Jesus uses take and receive by the passive taking meaning basically receiving, take and eat, is actually receive and eat. He uses the same Greek word, which is in the scriptures, for them when he said, receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. So 
So it's the exact same words. Word receive the Holy Spirit is the same word used to take, which is receive and eat. So it is the same. So they didn't grab the Holy Spirit and take it, take him. No, they received the Holy Spirit. And it's the same word used when Jesus says, take and eat, receive and eat. And actually, this is the same thing in the Latin Mass, in the translation of the uh, of the consecration. It is accipite, accept, and eat, comidite, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. Same thing, same word is used in the consecration of the chalice, of the wine, to receive, accipite, accept, receive, not take, which is the correct translation of the Greek. And uh, and he says here, the verb, accipite, denotes passive reception, while tolere indicates active taking. So, this was actually a really important point I found. It's like the scriptures themselves, it doesn't say take, it is receive. Taking in a passive sense. Same as take the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean they took. So anyways, we saw the contradiction from Cyril of Jerusalem, the hand position and what's being done and the preciousness of the sacred body and blood and, and don't lose a crumb and it's more precious than gold and diamonds. And what happens nowadays? Body and blood is on the floor. All right. So uh, now I think we're going to go with the... Uh, let's see. This is... Who's this here? Oh. And actually, uh, apostolic constitutions. Um, we're not going to go through it, but again... Uh, if you, you read the old documents, you notice that the Mass, the, actually one of the functions of deacons was to keep people awake <laughs> because the liturgy was not an hour. It wasn't 45 minutes. It is, was quite, quite long. Hours, five hours, six hours. That was how long the liturgy of the ancient church was. So when people talk about restoring the liturgy to the ancient past, well, uh, if you want to see what a real liturgy is, was the interpreter, the the traditional uh, Saturday night, the Paschal Vigil of the Roman Rite, or of the Byzantine. Byzantine has 15 readings, the Roman Rite has 12, plus the Gospel. All chanted throughout the night. That lasts four hours. So that is the most ancient part of the liturgy, actually. So if you want to imitate the, what is in the past, yeah, sure not. Why not? Um, so again, it says here that deacons, um, after the prayer, let some of them attend to the oblation, again, the sacrifice of the Eucharist, ministering to the Lord's body with fear. That deacons who is at the high priest's hand, says to the people, the right high priest is the bishop. Um, and after this, let the sacrifice follow the people standing and praying silently. So the sacrifice is taking place and the people praying silently. And when the oblation has been made, let every rank in itself partake of the Lord's body and precious blood in order. Not everybody at the same time. And approach with reverence and holy fear as to the body of their king. Let the women approach with their heads covered, so veiling. Uh, as is becoming the order of women. So uh, this was just a little point I wanted to bring here. So I will, uh, let's see, oh, that's what, now this is actually a very, very, very important document by Hippolytus, St. Hippolytus. He was um, um, a bishop of Rome, an anti-pope actually, who became a pope, but so he was a bishop, he reconciled with the, with the legitimate pope. So Hippolytus of Rome composed it in 215 AD. So he's talking about a tradition which is probably like 70, 100 years previous. So basically from the beginning of Christianity. And he's just passing on the tradition. So, uh, so he's re reiter reiterating the tradition because it might because of fear of innovation. Innovation is not a Christian Catholic thing. It is against 
the apostles' teaching. So the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. And this actually has, I might do a full video on this thing, but um, again, we're talking about communion in the hand, as we saw. The fathers pretty much unanimously, only in case of persecution would allow communion in the hand. Some people still maintained it, again, and whoever was doing it was forbidden by councils and, and bishops. Um, all right. So this one, again, actually is so important because it shows us, first of all, um, I'm going to get to the important. So widows, readers, again, all the ancient um, minor orders, readers, subdeacon, elector, they were all there. Um, so subdeacon from 215. And Paul VI wants to abolish it. Okay. Um, he cannot abolish apostolic tradition, first of all. No, he's not God. He's not Christ. He's just a vicar. And um, and again, actually a little kind of off the topic, but here, if there are any children who cannot answer for themselves, that's for baptism. So children who cannot answer for themselves, which means they're like what? Two years old? One years old? Their parents answer for them. So infant baptism or children really young who couldn't answer for themselves were baptized from the earliest times and the Virgin Mary is mentioned of course okay uh, the bishop shall give an explanation of all these things and those who are receiving breaking the bread distributing a piece to each he shall say the bread of heaven Jesus Christ and all will answer amen uh, the elders, so the priests, the presbyters, the priests, and the deacons. If the, okay, the, listen to this: the priests, the, the presbyters, the elders, and the deacons, if there are not enough priests, shall hold, uh, shall hold the cup and stand together in good order and with reverence. So actually, the bishop, if there's only a bishop and priest, so the priest would hold the cup and the deacon wouldn't. But if there is the, if the priests were actually giving the body and blood, the deacon was just holding the cup. But I want to just, there's a really important point about who is giving communion to whom. On the first day of the week, the bishop, if possible, shall deliver, the bishop shall deliver the oblation to all the people with his own hand. So the bishop will give the oblation, body, body of Christ, with his own hand while the deacons break the bread so they prepare the distribution of the Eucharist when the deacon brings it to the elder the priest the deacon shall present his platter and the elder shall take it to himself so the elder shall take it himself and distribute it to the people so not even the deacon distributes the priest the elder the presbyter he deli he distributes it to the people by his own hand Other days they will receive the oblation according to the command of the bishop. The deacon shall diligently be giving the oblation. So the deacon's function in case, uh, for the sixth, the deacon shall diligently be in, shall be diligent in giving the oblation, the body of Christ, to the sick. If there is no pres, presbyter, priest. So if there is no priest, the priest's function is to take it to the Eucharist to the sick. But if there is no priest, then the deacon will do it. So it shows you, not everybody can be grabbing the body of Christ. And notice the words, he will give it with his own hand. So if people are giving it to themselves, so they're giving it to themselves with their own hand. No, it is the, the bishop and the priest are giving it with their own hand to the people. And this contrasts, because it shows you the contrast here. Now he's talking about some blessed bread and kind of a group get together, not the Eucharist here. When they dine, the faithful present shall take from the hand of the bishop a small piece of bread before taking their own bread, because it is blessed, yet it is not the Eucharist, so something different, like the body of the Lord. Before they all drink, they shall take their cup. So the people take their cup. They, before they taking their own bread, so people take their bread, they take their cup, because this is just blessed. 
not the Eucharist. The Eucharist, the bishop gives it with his own hand, and the deacon gives the drink, the chalice, with his own hand. Eat and drink in moderation is with this gathering. It's not about the Eucharist here, which reminds me of what St. Paul said. Um, and again, fasting. Off the topic again, if a woman is pregnant or if someone is sick and cannot fast for the four two days, which are the days, Wednesdays and Fridays, from the beginning of the church, um, let them fast on a Saturday, taking bread and water if necessary. So when fasting means nothing, no water and no bread. That is what real fasting used to be. Not our one hour eat a McDonald's big hamburger before going to Mass. Uh, so uh, let's see here. Again, for us, the faithful shall be careful to partake of the Eucharist before eating anything else. Again, the ancient fast, no eating from midnight till the day of till Holy Communion. So don't eat anything fasting. So it's not an invention of the medieval times, you know. Um, All shall be careful that no unbeliever tastes of the Eucharist, nor mouse or other animals, so be careful, nor that any of it falls and is lost, for it is the body of Christ, to be eaten by those who believe and be not and not be scorned. So notice, no particle falls or lost. And otherwise, we are scorning the body of Christ. We are scorning God. Um, these are about prayers and so forth. So, again, the hours, the liturgy, the uh, uh, the breviary, the uh, the hours, uh, the the seven hours of prayer are actually mentioned from that early on. The sixth hour, the third hour, the ninth hour, the rising from the bed before waking up at midnight to pray matins. So it's all mentioned from two hundred and fifteen A.D. The sign of the cross, making the sign of the cross. Um, for all who hear the apostolic tradition, follow and keep it. No heretic will be able to introduce error, nor will any other person at all. It is this matter, manner, it is in this manner that the many heresies have grown. For those who were leaders did not wish to inform themselves of the opinion of the apostles. Ain't that true these days, huh? but did what they wanted according to their own pleasure and, and not what was appropriate. Huh. It is as if he's talking today. So that's why you can see earliest times from the beginning of the church, the sacredness, the, 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 this is the body of Christ, this is God. You have to be pure. You cannot be in sin. You have to recognize. Be careful not to drop a particle, a, a, anything, it's more precious than gold and diamonds. You have to approach with holiness. Don't innovate. Maintain the apostolic tradition. Fast before you receive Holy Communion. Only the deacon, the, the bishop and the priest would give Holy Communion the body and the deacon would just give the chalice. In case there is no priest, then the deacon would take the body and go to the homes of the sick and give them Holy Communion. So he wouldn't give, hey, here you go, buddy, take it to your relative and give him home. No, the, the deacon would do it in case there is no priest. So if there's a priest, the deacon wouldn't do it. He wouldn't dare touch the Eucharist. He would. The priest would be the one giving the Holy Communion. Um, so, as I said before, this innovation, this fakeness, this fraud, uh, which they try to pretend St. Cyril of Jerusalem taught is a fraud. It is a sacrilege. It defies all the ancient fathers. And even if in certain areas people did receive it in their hand, according to the way it's mentioned here, just kneeling, receiving without touching, being absolutely careful, not a crumb is left. This is not done these days. And if it were done in the past on a universal basis, which doesn't have, there's no evidence for it, even if it was done, it was suppressed very, 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 very early. If the sacred vessels in 115 
or when was it, 150 AD, were forbidden for anybody other than the priest to touch. Do you think they were allowed to touch the body of Christ? If the vessels, the the the, the the sacred vessels used in the liturgy were forbidden, except for the priest? Do you think people were allowed to touch God? I don't think so. So this is the teaching of the faith. This is the apostolic tradition, which are we are whole, supposed to hold. Just think about it. This is God incarnate. Just let this think in, sink into your mind. This is not a piece of bread. Even St. Cyril or St. Uh, which one says, don't let your senses be fooled. Don't let your senses fool you. But with firm faith, this believe this is the body and blood of Christ. This is God. This is Christ Jesus incarnate, the Holy One, the only one who is holy. Don't be fooled. Don't treat the holy like a potato chip. You will destroy, first you are sacrilegious, you offend God, you bring down judgment on yourself, and you destroy your own faith. You let your faith be destroyed because who dares touch God? Nobody. The angels prostrate. They dare not even look at God. And you want to take God, give him to yourself? That is not Christian. That is not Catholic. That is not apostolic. So, I know it's kind of hard sometimes to do, but do the right thing. Receive God incarnate on your mouth, on your tongue. Don't touch him. You do not dare to touch God incarnate. I do not dare. Nobody dares. Not even a bishop, a patriarch should dare to touch him if somebody else is consecrating the body of blood. Have humility. Have a sense of unworthiness because you are approaching your Lord and your maker. He is not your equal. He is not your buddy. He is your God. And that's it. So as I say every time, Try to find, attend a traditional liturgy, traditional Roman rite, traditional Byzantine rite, traditional Coptic rite, traditional Armenian rite, because the traditional rites convey the traditional faith, the apostolic tradition, the apostolic faith, the apostolic practice, the apostolic discipline. Because the way we pray is the way we believe. You change the way you pray, you will destroy the faith. As St. Saint Saint Hippolytus says, innovations caused heresies to creep in. Maintain the tradition, the apostolic tradition, and you will maintain your faith. And you will be, and what's the point of maintaining the faith? Is to reach eternal life. Because in sin, there is only death. In righteousness, and faith, and holiness, there is life eternal. To end the traditional rites, Catholic rites, work hard to promote the true faith. Please subscribe to this channel, share the videos, anything you want to point out to me, go ahead. I'll try to respond and um, that's it for today. Have a good day. Bye-bye.